morning and welcome this morning. And it's Pastor Wenger that is enjoying his small vacation. Today we will be having our services by Mark Alpert, who is a student at Westminster Seminary in Southern California. And he's actually a grandson of Tosses, as some of you know from my dad. So welcome in, and thank you very much. Mark? Well, it's very good to be with you this morning. I want to thank the consistory for inviting me, and Reverend Gonger as well. I'd like to uh, announce our pre-service hymn, which will be the Heavens Declare uh, Thy Glory. We'll be singing together out of the uh, Red Hymnal. call to worship this morning is from 2 Timothy, uh, verses 8 through 13, and our theme for this Lord's Day from our two sermon texts is going to be faith. So this, uh, this morning, we're going to look at uh, the faith of Peter, and this evening, we're going to be looking at the faith of uh, Bartimaeus. And here's what um, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy uh, in 2 Timothy 2, starting at verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that, that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So our call to worship is uh, a call to remember. Uh, throughout our week, we remember to do a lot of things. We remember to eat, we remember to put gasoline in our cars, we remember to go to work and to school. And here, the Apostle Paul is imploring us to remember not those things, but our Savior, the Christ, um, who will surely be returning for us, just as surely as he has already secured our salvation. 
So people of God, uh, receive this greeting uh, from your Lord. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's sing to the Lord together, uh, Holy, 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 from our red uh, hymnal. We'll be hearing God's law this morning from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. If you'd like, you can turn there with me in your Bible. This is Exodus 20, 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, 
but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor the animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We hear uh, the law of God read, and uh, most of us think that's a good law. Very few people would hear those things and think, oh, that's, that's not worthwhile. We, we recognize as we hear the, the word of the Lord read that uh, the man or woman who does these things would be blessed. It would be well with them to do these things. Yet we also feel uh, the condemning effect of the law. Uh, we hear this read and recognize that we don't keep this. We don't keep it flawlessly. We do not keep it perfectly. And in light of that, we ought to pray to the Lord together. So let's now pray uh, together, um, confessing our sins to him. Father in heaven, your word says that you are the Lord our God. Yet we so often act as if other things are our God. Oftentimes we are more, more obedient to our bosses at work than to you, even though they can't do a thing for our souls. Uh, Lord, we, um, we often follow our own desires, uh, even when our desires conflict with your commandments. And in this way, we are just like Adam and Eve. And so the problem of our race, the problem of rebellion against you, uh, continues from them all the way down to us. The human heart remains the same, uh, defiant, uh, rebellious, sinful. And Lord, we don't realize how dire our situation is, for if we did, we wouldn't sin as casually as we often do. Uh, so in light of our situation, uh, Father, we pray that you would forgive us from all of our sin, all of our sin known and unknown. Please do not hold any of it against us. And we pray this all in uh, Jesus, our mediator's name. Amen. Uh, let's uh, stand together um, and sing uh, God Be Merciful to Me. I believe it's number 255. Is that correct? 486. The wrong number. 486. God be merciful to me. Oh, yeah. 
It's a great blessing that our Lord uh, doesn't uh, merely send his law to us. Um, uh, We receive the law, uh, but it's not the last word from heaven. Uh, There's also the gospel, the good news. And this was the great uh, recovery of the Reformation. Uh, The good news got obscured in the medieval church. Um, The good news that is uh, so clear especially in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Um, I often think of um, the series of chapter 3s that we find in the epistles, whether that be Romans 3, Galatians 3, or Philippians 3. It's a very clear message of good news for God's people. Um, And this morning we're going to hear it from Philippians chapter 3, Paul's announcement of the good news to the church at Philippi, uh, which was uh, in... What is today known as Macedonia? Uh, This is Philippians 3, uh, verses 1 through uh, 9. Finally, my brothers, uh, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, uh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. And it's verse 9 that's the key verse there, isn't it? Because there, uh, Paul starkly points out the two ways and the two options. And these two options hold true for all humans. Option one is that we can try to stand in our own righteousness before a holy God. And Paul warns us, we won't be able to do it. He tells the Philippians, if you think you have a good resume, you should look at mine for a moment. And he runs through what he did according to the law. And then he says, that resume of mine, 
I consider rubbish. Uh, I recognize it won't justify me before God. It won't make me right because God's standard is perfection. So I don't seek to be found in myself holding my resume before God's throne, but I seek to be found in his son. I seek to be found in his son's righteousness by faith. And that's the good news. That's the fantastic news that's proclaimed with such clarity in our Reformed churches. And so uh, I'd like to assure you today uh, that if you have turned to Christ in faith, if you've repented of your sin, and if you trust that his righteousness has become your righteousness by faith in him, God's word says you are forgiven. And that's good news. And that's the essence of Christianity. So uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to invite uh, the deacons forward uh, for our uh, morning offering, which today will be for the general fund. Let's go to our Lord again for our congregational prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are so richly blessed. It is you who have uh, called us to worship. It is you who has greeted us. It is you who has announced to us uh, your law. Uh, and it is you, Lord, who has followed up on that law by uh, announcing to us the good news that Christ came and fulfilled the law on our behalf. And Lord, we're so thankful for the gift of faith. We know that we didn't produce it. We know that that was given to us by your spirit. And so now as reconciled people, as people who belong to you and who cannot lose their salvation, for that is the security you've given us in your word, we now can bring our requests to you. We bring our requests as... Uh, those who have been adopted, as those who are now children, as those who are now citizens in heaven, co-heirs with Christ. Lord, uh, your word announces so many glorious truths to our ears. And so we thank you for this. Uh, we recognize your greatness. Uh, we recognize your marvelous deeds. Uh, we see them all over the pages of scripture. Uh, we see how you uh, struck Pharaoh and the Egyptians with plagues uh, when they were trying to oppress your covenant people. We saw those signs and wonders in Egypt. We saw you split the Red Sea. We saw you lead uh, your people through the desert and into Canaan. We saw you give them a good land, a, a land flowing with milk and honey, and how you even gave them homes they didn't build uh, and orchards they didn't plant, and how they were able to eat and were satisfied. And Lord, we know that this was a shadow of the good things that are to come. We know that even now your son is preparing a place for us. We know that uh, we're going to have a seat at the wedding supper of the Lamb with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And for these things, Lord, we, we adore you and we say thank you for we're not deserving of any of this. Uh, but we are supremely grateful. 
We're thankful that you're patient with us. We're thankful that you don't forgive us only seven times, but seven times 70 and far beyond that. You are long-suffering with us. Uh, We are wayward. We will be wayward again this week, even though perhaps now we know that we shouldn't be. Uh, But such is our condition um, uh, in this world um, under the curse. Uh, Thank you for uh, walking with us and not letting us go through this life. Lord, we give you thanks for the beauty of spring, which we now see here in the Bay Area. Uh, The new leaves on the trees, the the new bloom, and various flowers, um, the fragrance coming from them. Uh, the warmer and longer days, uh, we know all of this comes from your providential hand. You're maintaining the seasons. Um, You are still sending rain and sunshine upon us, and we know that uh, you will do so as you see fit until the return of your son. Lord, so many of us enjoy good health, uh, eyes that can see, mouths that can speak, ears that can hear, legs that can walk and run. And we're thankful for our bodies, Lord. Uh, It's easy to take our health for granted until we have a problem. So now, um, as so many of us are are healthy, we we just pause to say thank you for that. Um, Lord, we're thankful for our homes. Uh, We live in such comfort compared to so many who have come before us on this earth. Uh, Our homes have showers and hot water and clean water and uh, sinks and ovens to cook our food and refrigerators. Um, It is just blessing after blessing that has come from your hand, and we thank you for these things. Uh, Lord, um, we're thankful for um, the various uh, foods you've given us. Uh, We know that uh, uh, we not only get an abundance of food, but a variety of food from you. Uh, Many of us will eat multiple types of proteins in one day, eggs and beef or chicken and various vegetables and fruits and and sweets and just so many extras, Lord. And even now as we look forward to uh, the fellowship lunch and and start to see some of the crock pots and the the buns with butter, and we just think we are blessed. Uh, Thank you for all of this, Lord. Uh, Lord, we also bring our petitions to you. Uh, Lord, we lift up the Dodd family, especially Danielle, uh, who has a a tumor while being pregnant. We pray that you will heal Danielle. We pray that you will remove that tumor, and we pray that she will have a healthy baby. We pray for Sharon Savage. Um, Lord, her situation right now is so tough with uh, cancer in multiple places. And Lord, we pray that you will draw near to Sharon. We pray that you will... um, impress upon her the promises of the gospel. Um, Please comfort her. Lord, we think of uh, Ruth Dieleman, uh, the wife of uh, Reverend uh, Adrian Dieleman in Visalia. We're thankful for the good report on Ruth this past week, uh, but we know that we need to uh, remain diligent in praying for her. We pray that you will restore her to full health and that uh, you will keep uh, her faith and uh, Adrian's faith uh, unwavering. Um, as they look to you. We pray for Hemina Barreto. Uh, we pray for a full recovery for Hemina after hernia surgery. Uh, Lord, we pray for Lita, uh, who has breast cancer. And Lord, we know it's an aggressive cancer. And we pray that through um, medicine and whatever means you see fit, that you would heal Lita, Lord. Lord, we're thankful that uh, Reverend Ganger and his family are able to um, Enjoy some time away. We pray that you will give them safe travel and refreshment. Uh, Lord, we pray that the um, the tithes and offerings that we just brought to you will be used to strengthen this church, and we pray that you will bless this church for many generations and decades to come. And Father, as um, we soon will turn to the reading and the preaching of your word, uh, we pray that your spirit would be active. Uh, Lord, we know it's the Holy Spirit who makes the word effective in drawing people to Christ and in strengthening our faith. And so we pray that you would do that um, in our sermon text and sermon this morning. Lord, we trust that you hear our prayer, for we belong to you. So we pray this uh, uh, in Jesus' name, and now we pray silently to ourselves.
Let's stand together and sing uh, When Peace Like a River. And can our pianist give us the number on that, please? 691. 691. Let's stand together. invite you to uh, turn with me to Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. This is our sermon passage this morning. So to provide some context prior to reading this passage, uh, we're halfway through Matthew's uh, gospel. It's a 28-chapter uh, book. And uh, Jesus has just healed some people uh, on the uh, edge of the Sea of Galilee. And he has also uh, performed a miraculous feeding from only five loaves of bread and two fish. And so we're picking up our story right after that happened. 
That's uh, verse 22. Uh, Here begins the reading of God's word. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But... When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Objects which are denser than water will sink when they're placed on the surface of water. That's a fact. If you take a brick and put it on top of your backyard pool, it will sink. You take a rock, put it on top of the Pacific Ocean, it will sink. And if this coming summer you drive down to Emeryville and try to walk across the San Francisco Bay out to Alcatraz on the water, you won't be able to do it because your legs are denser than the water that you're trying to walk on. Our story this morning is interesting because in it, this scientific fact was defied one morning. On that morning long ago, our Lord strolled out on top of the water step by step with the same ease that any man would have walking through a neighborhood park. Of course, this event must mean something. It wasn't put in this book just to wow us, so it's our business to identify the significance of this miraculous sign. The main idea of our story is that out on the water, Jesus demonstrates that he is God's Son. There are three scenes in our passage. Scene number one, Jesus walks on the water. Scene number two, Jesus saves Peter. And scene number three, Jesus is worshipped. We are going to look at all three of these. First, scene number one, Jesus walks on water. Our passage opens by saying, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. What do you think the disciples were thinking as they set sail? They had just seen the compassion of Jesus. He just healed many people who were sick. And they just saw Jesus feed dinner to a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, from only five loaves of bread and two fish. 
So what were the disciples thinking as they set sail? Who was this teacher they were following? How could he do the things he was doing? Teaching, feeding, healing. Our text says that Jesus didn't get on the boat right away. But after some time passes, Jesus sees that the boat his disciples are on is caught in a storm. So Jesus decides to go out to the boat, but he doesn't put on a life jacket, rent a jet ski, and zip out to the boat. What does our uh, text say? It says in verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Imagine being the disciples. You're exhausted. You've been battling this storm all night. And now you see something moving toward you on the surface of the water. What is that? Who is that? Step, step, step. And they scream in verse 26. It's a ghost. But this figure walking toward them says, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. They recognize the voice and the look of the one talking to them, but no, it can't be. Jesus? They're not sure. What these guys don't say is, Oh, Jesus, thanks for walking out on the water to us. Why don't you grab an oar and help us get this thing to shore? They don't say that at all. The disciples have never seen anything like this. They've never seen our Lord do this. Then Peter speaks. Verse 28. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. What a bizarre comment. They're in a storm. They're not sure if a ghost is talking to them. And to get some greater clarification, Peter sets up a little test. If it's you, Jesus, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus goes along with Peter's little request and says, Come. That takes us to scene number two. Jesus saves Peter. So Peter climbs down out of the boat. This alone would have been difficult in the midst of the storm. Uh, The boat is uh, lifting and falling. It's being pushed and pulled. Somehow this determined man gets over the edge of the boat swings over one leg, swings over the other, drops his legs onto the water. Remember, objects which are denser than water will sink when they're placed on the surface of water. It's something we all know instinctually. We don't need a scientist to tell us that. But as Peter's foot touched the water and as he brought his other leg down, his legs, which are denser than water, don't sink down. He's now standing on the water with our Lord. And verse 29 says, he came toward Jesus. How about that? Peter and his rabbi walking on the tumultuous sea. The wind is ripping around them, and everyone in the boat is watching, spellbound. Step, step, step. It's quite the scene. But then Peter's attention shifted. His attention moved from Jesus to the wind. Peter gets scared. Jesus had told all of them in verse 27, Don't 
be afraid. But now in verse 30, Peter is afraid. And he begins to sink. His feet aren't on top of the water anymore. That old law of science is working like it always does. He begins to drop. He sees the writing on the wall. He's drowning. Coming to terms with his own helplessness, Peter cries, Lord, save me. Can you imagine if Jesus had just let him go? I told you not to fear, Peter. I agreed to this little request of yours, and you feared. What if Jesus had just let him go? There lies Peter on the bottom of the sea. He got scared and drowned. Thankfully, that's not the heart of our Lord. That's not the heart of our Lord toward his people. Jesus had just shown compassion to the crowds, healing them and feeding them. Now he shows compassion to Simon Peter. After Peter cried, Lord, save me, did you notice the next word? Verse 31, immediately. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Immediately. And after Jesus hauled him up, he looks at Peter and says, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And this remark brings us to the crux of what we need to consider. People have been hearing this story for centuries. And one of the first things some people will say is, No way. I was tracking with this Jesus guy. I liked his Sermon on the Mount. He could tell a clever parable. But this is too much. I can't believe that Jesus walked on water. Come on. That's impossible. Did you think that in your own heart as we read this? Spiritual doubt can shake us just as violently as the wind shook Peter out on the sea. Down through the years, plenty of people have doubted the historical accuracy of this story. And they doubt it because they know that humans can't walk on water. Again, we all know what would happen if we tried this stunt on the San Francisco Bay this coming summer. We wouldn't be able to walk out on the water to Alcatraz. We would sink. So what's the deal with Jesus? Is this an imaginary story meant to teach some sort of timeless truth? Or could this man really tread on the waves of the sea? The key to understanding this passage is to remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is the creator. And Jesus is the sustainer of all things. Skeptics read this passage and say, no mere man could walk on water. And I agree with them. And then I'd add, Jesus is no mere man. He's the God-man. He's not identical to us. Every person who has ever lived has been born from a father and a mother. Unlike the rest of us, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus, according to his divine nature, has authority over the sea. The rest of us don't have a divine nature. That's why we would drown if we tried to do something like this. Additionally, the Bible tells us that all of creation was made by Jesus. John 1, verse 3. Through him all things were made. Jesus made everything in the world. 
the Sea of Galilee is not just a sea, it's his sea. Jesus placed the Sea of Galilee in its exact location. Jesus invented water and wind and waves. These things were all his idea. If you're the one who made everything, the land, the animals, the sea, and if you are God in human flesh, is it really too much to take a stroll out on the water that you made? I don't think so. In addition to being the God-man and the creator, Jesus is the sustainer of this world. I imagine that many of the children here know the song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. You guys know that one? Yeah, a lot of us learned that um, when we were growing up. And it's great because it's based on a theological truth. Colossians chapter 1 says that in Jesus, all things hold together. Our world is still going in 2022 because Jesus is keeping it together. And I'll add one other thing. Colossians 1 says that creation was not only made by Jesus, it was also made for Jesus. This world is a theater for the glory of Jesus Christ. This world was made from the get-go to draw people to Christ so that we would worship Him. So when we doubt the possibility that Jesus walked on water, it's because our thinking is problematic. There's not a problem with the story. There's a problem with our brains. We're forgetting who the one walking on water is. Jesus is not a mere man like us. He's the God-man. Jesus is not a creature like us. He's the creator. He sustains everything. And this world is his theater. It exists to draw people to him. So that's why Jesus speaks a firm word to Peter once he yanks the fishermen back above the water. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Jesus is trying to shake these boys into recognizing who he is. He's no ghost. And he's no mere man. And that takes us to our third and final scene. Jesus is worshipped. Well, the disciples had seen a lot. In the last 24 hours, they had seen miraculous healings, miraculous feeding, and now a miraculous water walk. Now as Jesus and Peter climb into the boat, as if on cue, the wind dies down. It dies down with the timing of a choir that knows just how long to hold the last note. Now all is still. These boys in the boat had seen the whole ordeal out on the sea. They saw their brash colleague Peter make a bizarre demand, followed by Jesus rescuing him. And the Holy Spirit who draws people to Christ must have been working in the souls of these boys. They no longer think Jesus is a ghost. In fact, as the wind came to a standstill, and as the water became calm, the disciples looked into the face of their rabbi, and verse 33 says, they worshipped him. They said, truly, you are the Son of God. What a statement. Can you believe that they said this? These boys are Jews. Circumcised on the eighth day. Raised in the synagogue. Familiar with all the Jewish festivals and laws. They surely knew God's first two commandments. Don't have any other gods before the Lord. And do not make an idol for yourself. The Jews had one God. He demanded total loyalty. He did not tolerate idolaters. He had a track record of making the covenant land vomit idolaters out of it. Yet, here are these pious Jews in the boat start worshiping their teacher. 
How do we explain this? If there were Pharisees on this boat, they would have wanted these boys stoned to death for worshiping someone the Pharisees thought was a mere man. Beloved, here's what the boys in the boat had concluded. As Job chapter 9 says, only God can tread on the waves of the sea. As the book of Exodus shows, only God can save. As Genesis chapter 1 indicates, only God controls the creation. And as Psalm 2 says, a Messiah is coming, and He will even be God's Son. So with what they knew, with what they saw, these boys are convinced. Jesus, truly, you are the Son of God. You want to talk about truth? You want to talk about ultimate reality? It's Him. All of life, all of history, all of human spirituality finds its ultimate explanation in the God-man. So people of uh, Trinity URC, what are you going to do with this story? You have to do something with it. You can write it off as too sensational to be real. You can call it a good tale for children. Or you can bow. You can do what the disciples did. They knew everything you know. Men can't walk on water, and mere humans should not be worshipped. But if, instead of ignoring what just happened, the disciples changed their opinion about their rabbi. They realized that Jesus can't be a mere human. He must be God's son, the son that the Old Testament prophets wrote about. This picture of a man drowning before the Lord is the position all of us found ourselves in before becoming Christians. Totally helpless. All of us needed Jesus to reach out his hand and rescue us. In fact, the whole Christian religion is summarized in the picture we find in verses 30 and 31 of our text. This picture of Peter drowning and Jesus being there. It's not a picture of us figuring out a way to get into the boat on our own. It's not a picture of us doing our part and God doing His part. Instead, the Christian religion is a picture of a God who loves the unlovable, who helps the helpless, and who independently saves sinners. Martin Luther once famously said, If I could have control of my salvation in my own hand, I wouldn't take it for a minute. I want my salvation controlled by God's hand, because He's reliable, and I'm not. Jesus was always reliable for Peter, wasn't he? Even on the night Jesus was betrayed, he told Peter ahead of time, tonight you're going to deny me, Peter. You're going to say that you don't even know me. Can you imagine that Peter would do that after what Jesus did for him out on the lake? There's the backdrop to Gethsemane and Caiaphas' house, it's the Sea of Galilee. He had already seen what Jesus could do. Yet on that night, the night of his betrayal, there they are, standing at Caiaphas' house, warming themselves by the fire, and a servant girl comes up to Peter. Hey, aren't you with Jesus? You're one of his followers. You're a disciple of his. Oh, no, I'm not. Don't even know the guy. 
Really? Because your accent indicates that you're from the same place he is. No, I, I don't know him. In light of all of that, uh, Jesus still told Peter ahead of time, I will pray for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail. <laughs> and when you are restored, strengthen your brothers. So Peter's faith was tested at Caiaphas' house, just as it was tested on the lake. And Peter's faith would again look lousy. Mr. Bravado, in moments of safety, is Mr. Timid in moments of danger. But here was the good news for Peter. His little faith was always being supported by a strong Christ. And the good news for all of us here today, for all of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, our faith is not riding on us. It's riding on our Savior, who has elected us, who has saved us, who will return for us, and who won't ever depart from us. I imagine that there are people here at Trinity who occasionally know what it's like to be shaken by spiritual doubt. Or is this church too pious for such things? Let's be honest. As Peter's faith got shaky on the sea, so too do we all have moments throughout our lives when our faith gets shaky too. In light of this, pray for each other. In light of this, always return to the word which reveals life. That is the scriptures. The Spirit always works through. And pray that the Spirit of the age won't blind us from seeing the glory of our Christ and the good plan He has in store for all of us. And with that, we've arrived at our destination. We saw that objects which are denser than water will sink when they're placed on the surface of water unless the Almighty ever chooses to come out and tread on the waves of his sea. Praise be to this God, our covenant God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we love this story. We love it because it reveals good things about you. It uh, reveals that when uh, your people cry, Lord, save me, you do in fact save. Uh, Lord, it reveals that you're in control. It reveals that you're powerful. It reveals that you're good. So we have so much confidence in your character and your ability. We're so thankful that we belong to you. We look forward to the day that our, in which our eyes will see uh, you, O oh Christ, and all of your majesty. In the meantime, uh, maintain our faith and keep it steadfast. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, stand together and sing, uh, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, number 521.
For our uh, benediction and doxology, I'd like to uh, pray for the food that we're going to enjoy uh, with our fellowship lunch. And I also look forward to uh, getting together again tonight at 5 o'clock where we get to see this interaction between blind Bartimaeus and Jesus on the Jericho Road, Mark chapter 10. Really looking forward to that. Uh, Let's pray together for our lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that we can hear from you as you've gathered us uh, to do so. And now we pray that uh, we would be blessed by both the fellowship and the food that we will be eating uh, after our service. We pray, pray that it will be nourishing to our bodies, and we pray that you will continue to strengthen the relationships between people uh, here at Trinity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. After our benediction, we will be singing uh, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Congregation of Jesus Christ, receive this benediction from your Lord from the book of Jude. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before His presence with exceeding great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.